Five. Is brown sugar better than white sugar? By far the greater part of sugar from the cane ends up as refined white sugar. A small quantity is sold as brown sugar, but not all the brown sugar available to the consumer is this unrefined raw cane sugar. Some, as we have seen, is manufactured from white refined sugar, either from cane or beet, by the addition of molasses or caramel. Unfortunately, it is legally permissible to describe as demerara the light brown sugar made in this fashion, which bears a superficial resemblance to the raw sugar produced in the first boiling. The characteristics of the unrefined raw sugars depend on several factors. First, there is an increasing proportion of molasses trapped within the sugar crystals as the syrup passes from the first to the third crystallization producing first demerara sugar, then light muscovado and dark muscovado. Thus, each successive sugar is of a deeper brown colour, accentuated by the greater degree of caramelization caused by repeated boiling and crystallization, and has a stronger flavour of caramel and molasses, known as treacle in Britain. But other factors are also involved. Strains of sugarcane produce juices containing differing amounts of substances with various undesirable qualities, some of which will adhere to the sugar during crystallization. By choosing an appropriate strain of cane and taking care to keep extraneous materials out of it when it is harvested and cut, the raw sugar produced can be made to consist of clean, evenly sized, bright crystals with an attractive brown color and a pleasant taste and aroma. Without these standards of diligence and care, the same general process can yield a dirty product, containing easily observable non-sugar particles mixed with uneven particles of dull brown sugar, the whole having an unattractive aroma. This is especially noticeable in the crystallization of the dark muscovado, but may be detected too in demerara, this does not matter if the raw sugar is produced as an intermediate stage on the way to the refinery. However, some of this dirty raw sugar, not really fit for consumption, is put on the market side by side with the clean raw sugar intended from the outset to be consumed in the unrefined state. You can see the difference in quality if you closely examine just a teaspoonful placed on a white saucer and shaken into a thin layer. Careful inspection will also show the difference between those unrefined sugars and the brown sugars made by adding molasses to white sugar. With the latter, you will notice that the colour is only on the surface, and a quick rinse with a little water will reveal the white crystals of sucrose. In the UK, however, this kind of testing should be unnecessary, since labelling makes it easy to distinguish these two kinds of brown sugar. The raw sugars are labelled as unrefined or raw, and the country of origin is given. The coloured white sugars have to be labelled so as to indicate their ingredients. The wording will be something like, Ingredients, Cane Sugar, Molasses. These sugars are also likely to be given some such description as light brown or dark brown or London demerara or golden granulated. There was a time when brown sugar, like brown bread, was considered to be less pure and less desirable. It was also less costly then. As a result, it was the wealthier people who ate white bread and white sugar while it was an aspiration of the less wealthy to be able to do the same. But from time to time a minority took the view that far from the brown colour indicating a degree of impurity, it indicated that the food was better because it had not been deprived of some important nutritious components. Unlike brown bread, however, which is almost always bread made from flour produced from whole wheat or lightly milled wheat, a great deal of the available brown sugar is made, as we saw, by the addition of caramel or molasses as a coating to crystals of refined white cane or beet sugar. 
Many of those who buy brown sugar do so in the belief that they are buying raw sugar. This does not matter much if the brown sugar is bought because of its taste. The situation is altered, however, if it is bought in the belief that it retains some nutrients that are removed when raw sugar is refined. The conventional view of the nutritionist used to be that neither coloured white sugar nor raw sugar contains anything that gives it a significant higher nutritional value than that of refined sugar. I too held this view when I wrote the first edition of this book. Since that time, however, my colleagues and I have carried out a series of experiments that showed that at least some raw sugars may contribute to the nutritional value of a diet. We decided to do these experiments because of the publication in 1981 of a series of reports describing research carried out in several laboratories in the USSR. These compared the effects in rats and mice of feeding diets containing either white, refined sugar or brown, unrefined muscovado sugar. The animals fed the brown sugar were reported as showing more rapid growth, prolonged life, less increase in the concentration of cholesterol in the blood, large litters, and a better metabolic picture, especially in relation to carbohydrate metabolism. The Soviet workers claimed that these beneficial properties of the brown sugar resided in a number of complex organic substances, to which they gave the name Biologically Active Substances, BAS. Their results were sufficiently striking for us to examine these claims in our own laboratory. We made up our usual sort of laboratory diet, which contained protein, fat, vitamins and mineral salts together with either refined sugar or brown muscovado sugar or pure starch. We fed our rats from the age of three weeks with one or other of these diets. Our results were very different from those reported by the Soviet workers. We could not confirm their claims. The different sugar diets produced the same growth rate, size of litters and carbohydrate metabolism. The only differences were the usual ones we had discovered between rats-fed sugar and rats-fed starch. After about two years of experiment, we were about to discontinue our research when we decided to carry out one last investigation. We thought it would be interesting to see what the effect was, not simply on the rats themselves, but on their pups. We therefore allowed the pups to stay with their mothers until they were ready to be weaned at three weeks or so. To our surprise, about half the pups born to mothers fed starch or white sugar died when they were between 10 and 15 days old, whereas most of those born to mothers fed brown sugar survived until they were weaned at 22 or 23 days. We repeated these experiments several times until about 300 pups had been born to mothers on each of the three diets. Of the total of 909 pups born, the survival score was 37% from mothers fed starch, 53% from mothers fed white sugar, and almost 90% from mothers fed brown sugar. What is more, every one of the starch pups and white sugar pups even those that survived, were clearly ill, with swollen abdomens and weak hind legs. On the other hand, none of the brown sugar pups showed these abnormalities. We were unable to identify whatever it was in the brown sugar that kept the pups alive and well. We did, however, get as far as showing that it was not some complex, biologically active substance since the effect was still demonstrated when we incinerated the sugar to ash. This burned off all the organic material as well as the sugar itself, leaving only mineral salts. When this ash was added to the mother's white sugar diet, most of the pups survived, just as they did when the mothers were fed on the brown sugar diet. What conclusion can we draw then about the comparative value of the white and brown sugars. 
First, we can be sure that the coloured brown sugars have no measurable nutritional advantage over white sugar, even when the only addition is molasses. The quantity is far too small to contribute anything worthwhile. Second, we have not found so far that raw sugar modifies any of the undesirable effects of white sugar. But third, I have to say that the dark muscovado sugar, which carries with it a sizable proportion of the molasses from which it crystallizes, does contain some materials that in some circumstances can contribute to the nutritional value of the diet. We carried out our experiments not so much because we thought they might tell us something directly about the effect of raw sugar on the health of baby rats, but because the whole process of reproduction, pregnancy, giving birth and lactation is a period of physiological stress. A diet that is for most purposes just adequate is more likely to show a marginal nutritional inadequacy when such a physiological stress is imposed. If, then, I am asked whether one should eat brown sugar or white, my answer is in two parts. First, for reasons that are explained in the rest of this book, I strongly believe it is better not to eat sugar at all. Second, if you feel that you must take sugar, then it makes sense to eat brown sugar, provided it really is a good quality raw sugar. You should choose a clean dark muscovado sugar, which contains the greatest proportion of molasses, and so of the unidentified nutrients. You should also remember that it is white refined sugar that is used by the manufacturers of all the common soft drinks, ice cream, confectionery, chocolate, and sweet cakes and biscuits.